So I'm uh, Jim Carafano. I'm the Vice President for Foreign and Defense Policy. And uh, I think we're, uh, we're going to begin. So this event, oh, so I have the admin stuff. OK. So if you have cell phones that beep or buzz or sing or I was once in a Latin America event, and the guy didn't turn his cell phone off and rang and started singing La Cucaracha. He was like a little embarrassed. But um, so if you would silence those or turn them off, that'd be great. Um, the, the, uh, we, we'll, we're going to do, in each of the panels, we're going to do commentary, and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. So I would just ask if you have a um, question, please wait for a microphone. Uh, that way folks that are listening online uh, or who might listen to the event later on, because we, we record all the events and then we post them online, have an opportunity to hear your questions. So if you'd wait for the microphone, and then if you would just state your name and affiliation, that would be awesome. And uh, each of the speakers will speak about 10 minutes or so, so we should have some time for, even though we're starting just a bit late, some, um, some time for questions. So the, just as a brief introduction, this event was actually inspired by the President's um, Countering Violent Extremism uh, Conference last fall, because I thought it actually largely failed to really portray a, a narrative of understanding of just the basic who, what, when, where, and why of US concerns about global terrorism uh, and how to respond to them. And so I really wanted to assemble a group of very knowledgeable people who don't necessarily agree on everything, but I think among them really have a, a corpus of, of great knowledge on the spectrum of issues that you really need to uh, delve into. And so that's why we organize these panels today. And the first panel really looks, I think, at a fundamental debate and a fundamental choice um, where we, we of two different roads. The one road was really defined by the president's um, counterterrorism strategy that he published back in, I believe it was 2011, where he, he narrowed the scope of US interest to saying, well, we're, what we're really concerned about is the core leadership of Al-Qaeda and any group that decides to operationalize and, and conduct attacks aimed at the US homeland. So it was a very kind of narrow definition of what the nature of the problem is. And there's a contrasting view of that, uh, which was um, argued by some scholars, including uh, Mary Habeck at the American Enterprise Institute, who's the author of this map, by the way, who says, well, look, you really need to look at this not as a bunch of disparate groups um, who are where the primary threat is the uh, aiming of attacks, uh, specifically in the United States, but as, as a as a body of people who are trying to organize essentially a, glob a global Islamist insurgency with the, with the ultimate object objective of establishing regional dominance. And this map is kind of her analysis of, of looking at uh, um, what the different groups are saying they, they are trying to achieve and what their goals are. And I, I think it's a, a kind of an interesting graphic portrayal of what um, what the scope of their ambitions are. And, and, and that, I think, is a key fundamental debate because you would deal with a global Islamist insurgency different than you would deal with um, just, in a sense, trying to mitigate the threat of disparate um, terrorist groups. So this first panel is going to, I think, really uh, grapple with the, the scope of the question of, of what is the scope of the threat? Um, who, what are these groups? What are their goals? Um, what is the state of their capabilities now? Um, and to do that, I'm just going to very briefly introduce our panelists. So Tom Jocelyn is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a senior editor of the Long War Journal, which is a, a tremendous resource if you are not familiar with it. It's a widely read publication, deals with counterterrorism and related issues. He has testified numerous times before Congress. He publishes all over the place. Where it's just a joy to have him and, and a, a joy to work with uh, FDD on, on, on different programs. Um, David Garstein Ross is a um, uh, adjunct, has an, a lot of hats, um, including an adjunct professor at uh, George Washington University in the Security Studies Program, and only the best people teach there, so I'm good with that, um, and Catholic University. And he's also the chief executive officer of Valence Global, which is a consulting firm that, that uh, deals with many of these issues. And uh, Jim Phillips is our senior, a longstanding senior research fellow at Heritage for Middle East Affairs. He has written widely and published numerously and testified many, many times before Congress, and most scarily, having worked with Jim for 12 years now, mm -hmm. predicts almost every bad thing that's going to happen in the Middle East before it does. So now I know what it's like to be married to, uh, what was that guy, uh, Nostradamus. So um, so I think, I, think we'll, if, I think we'll start with Jim, right, you, and who's going to give some kind of historical context to, to the idea or the scope of the threat today, and then... Sure. David and Tom. Okay, and then we'll go to Q and A for the first panel. So, Jim, over to you. 
Well, according to the Obama administration, the U.S. is involved uh, in a politically correct war, uh, a struggle against violent extremism in overseas contingency operations to prevent man-caused disasters. Now, I'd say uh, we're in a war against Islamist totalitarianism, not at war with Islam, the religion, but with Islamism uh, and Islamist extremists who profess a totalitarian ideology that poses not, a, not only a threat to us, but to uh, moderate Muslims. In the modern era, Islamist totalitarian revolutionaries first came to power in Iran. And I think if we're mapping uh, Islamist insurgencies, the appropriate place to start is with the Persian Gulf region, not only because of the importance of Iran's 1979 Islamic revolution, but also because Islamist totalitarians of many stripes are funded uh, and fueled by the massive influx of hundreds of billions of dollars of petrodollars into the P Persian Gulf, after uh, into Persian Gulf oil exporting states after the 1973 Arab oil embargo, this huge transfer of economic wealth, one of the largest in world's history, has financed a rapid expansion in, of political and ideological influence of two kinds of Islamist revolutionary movements. You have Ayatollah Khomeini's Shiite revolution based in Iran and Sunni Islamist extremists, uh, some of them influenced by Wahhabi ideology, which are financed by rich individuals and Islamic charities in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states. These two Islamist revolutionary movements each seek to lead the Muslim world into a clash of civilizations, not only against the West, but against uh, China, against India, against Africa, against all other civilizations. But right now, uh, they're engaged more in a clash within Islamic civilization. They're not only viol violently opposing each other, increasing ch clashes in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, but they're also clashing with secular nationalists and mo more moderate uh, Islamic movements. And this is the reason I, I say uh, there is no Islamic threat. Uh, that is, there's no single monolithic unified Islamic threat to the United States and the West. There are many different Islamist extremist threats, uh, many discrete threats posed by competing and rival organizations that sometimes clash and sometimes cooperate to threaten the U.S. and its allies. A second takeaway that I'd like to leave you with is that I think the United States has focused on the terrorist threat without an adequate appreciation of the revolutionary ideology that inspires this threat. Uh, terrorism is not an end to itself. It's a means to an end. It's a tactic used to advance uh, a global strategy for Islamist revolution. Uh, this is a worldwide insurgency uh, in support of building an Islamic state or empire. These Islamist extremists promise uh, heaven on earth, uh, but they deliver hell on earth. Uh, this is the satanic utopianism that William F. Buckley uh, first warned about in the founding statement of National Review. Um, he considered communism to be the greatest threat of his time uh, that was posed by coercive utopianists. Uh, but I think he would agree that Islamist extremists pose a similar challenge in our time. Just as the Nazis pursued ideological goals that triggered World War II and Soviet communists triggered the Cold War, I think we're now living in an era of a third world war, uh, a struggle against Islamist extremism. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the uh, Iranian branch of that and then say a little about the uh, initial evolution of the Al-Qaeda network. Uh, since the 1979 Islamic uh, Revolution in Iran, uh, Iran's revolutionaries have used terrorism as a strategic tool to seize power, to maintain themselves in power against uh, rising opposition, and to undermine the power and influence of foreign enemies. Indeed, it was an act of terror, the November 4th, 1979 seizure of the U.S. hostages at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, that enabled Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, Islamist uh, supporters to, to outflank uh, the, the Barzagan provisional government, uh, outbid secular nationalists and leftists, and consolidate their power and control over Iran. Uh, 
Iran's strenuous attempts to export its revolution have largely failed, in part because most Muslims uh, do not share uh, its Shiite uh, branch of, of religion, uh, which is only shared by about 15% of the world's Muslims. Iran's attempt to foment revolution among Iraqi Shia and Saudi Shia were crushed in the 1980s, as was a coup attempt in Bahrain in 1981. But unlike Iran's attempts to export revolution, its, ex its attempts to export terrorism paid off in a big way, particularly in Lebanon, where the Shiites formed the largest single group in a mosaic of 17 uh, sects and, and ethnic groups. Iran created, financed, armed, and trained Hezbollah, the party of God, which it used as a surrogate to attack its enemies, including the US and France, uh, both of whom participated in the multinational force in Lebanon. Both were hit on the same day, October 23rd, 1983, in which 241 US Marines were killed at Beirut airport, and 58 French paratroopers uh, were hit at the headquarters of the French forces. Hezbollah also took 15 American hostages in Lebanon that became the genesis of the Iran-Contra affair. Two of those hostages were murdered. Uh, William, F., uh, William Buckley, uh, the CIA station chief in Beirut, and Lieutenant Colonel William Higgins, who was uh, part of the peacekeeping force in southern Lebanon. Uh, before 9-11, Hezbollah had killed more Americans than any other terrorist group and was referred to as the A-team of terrorism. In addition to supporting uh, terrorism in Shiite areas, it also had ex success in exporting terrorism to Sunni Arab areas. After Iran's uh, attempts to stir up Shia revolutions were crushed in the 1980s, Iran became more ecumenical and reached out to Sunni Islamist extremist organization in the 1990s. This did not make much sense in a strict ideological sense, but it does in a geopolitical sense because it put them in touch with the strongest opposition groups uh, within states that were aligned against Iran and aligned with the US, especially Egypt uh, and Saudi Arabia. Sudan became a key partner in Iran's efforts to reach out to these radical Islamist extremists after the 1989 coup that brought uh, General Omar Bashir to power uh, and his version of a, a, a somewhat of an Islamic state, although he, he eventually broke with uh, most Islamic extremists in Sudan. But Sudan was a useful ally for Iran. Uh, hundreds of Iranian military advisors went there to advise the Sudanese army. Revolutionary guards uh, offered courses in, in internal security. And Iran offered a strategic foothold that outflanked uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia and allowed Iran to extend its influence throughout North Africa. In particular, the Sudanese regime gave Iran access uh, to a, a new uh, and fast-growing Islam, Sunni Islamist uh, group, which we now know by Al-Qaeda. Uh, Osama bin Laden was in exile in Sudan until 1996. And according to US intelligence, uh, uh, Ira uh, it was in Sudan where Iran's Revolutionary Guards first made contact with Osama bin Laden. And through Iran, Al-Qaeda also made contact with Hezbollah, uh, Iran's chief terrorist subcontractor, and they formed a, t a temporary tactical alliance. Uh, today, they're battling, and uh, Hezbollah is battling various Al-Qaeda franchises in Syria and Lebanon in an all-out struggle for power. Uh, but back then, they shared common enemies in the US, Israel, uh, and moderate Sunni Arab regimes. And so Hezbollah was, was able to transfer some of its uh, bomb-making expertise to al-Qaeda, which helps explain some of the, the quantum leap in the destructiveness of al-Qaeda bombs. Uh, going up to uh, uh, June 1996, the Kobar Towers uh, attack, which is suspected of being a joint operation of Saudi Hezbollah, uh, and Al-Qaeda, uh, that struck the Kobar Towers housing complex, killing 19 American servicemen who were uh, carrying out the, or enforcing the no-fly zone in southern uh, Iraq. Uh, and Iran today has a very uh, mysterious, uh, convoluted, uh, love-hate or frenemy relationship with Al-Qaeda. There's elements of cooperation and competition.
Uh, Iran has hosted a number of top al-Qaeda officials at various times, including Saif al-Adal, a top coordinator, Saad bin Laden, Osama's eldest son, and Suleiman Abu Ghaith, a Kuwaiti who served as al-Qaeda's chief spokesman. Iranians initially denied their presence, then they said they didn't know exactly who they had, and then they maintained that these al-Qaeda members were under house arrest, uh, but uh, they were able while under this supposed house arrest to continue launching attacks against the West and against Saudi Arabia, Iran's enemies. Uh, Al-Qaeda cadres were guarded by the elite Jerusalem force, uh, the Quds force uh, of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. This uh, force is entrusted with carrying out liaison duties with Iran's uh, uh, like-minded birds of a, fe a feather, I Islamist uh, militants and revolutionaries around the world, including Sunni organizations such as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, Ayman Zawahiri, formerly bin Laden's chief attendant, now his successor is believed to be a crucial liaison between Iran and al-Qaeda. He reportedly negotiated a sanctuary arrangement inside Iran following the uprooting of al-Qaeda's infrastructure in Afghanistan in 2001. In addition to the safe haven, the Quds Force provided al-Qaeda members with travel documents. According to the 9-11 Commission, there's strong evidence that Iran facilitated the transit of al-Qaeda members <coughs> into and out of Afghanistan before 9-11, and that some of these were future 9-11 hijackers. At least eight and possibly 10 of the 19 uh, hijackers on September 11th transited Iran on the way uh, to and from Afghanistan, taking advantage of Iranian practice of not stamping their Saudi passports. Uh, these were the muscle uh, terrorists, and it's not clear that they knew exactly what their uh, assignment was going to be, and, and therefore it's, there's no proof that Iran knew exactly uh, what this operation was going to include, but that can't be uh, ruled out. Iran also turned a blind eye when al-Qaeda transferred its personnel from Afghanistan to Iraq after the U.S. intervention there. Bin Laden named Abu Musab Zarqawi as his deputy in Iraq in 2004. He was a Jordanian of Palestinian descent that had be, been uh, radicalized in prison, and his, his extreme uh, uh, brutality uh, by virtue of his background as a prison enforcer uh, eventually uh, uh, horrified even some of Bin Laden's followers. And Zawahiri uh, advised him to kind of cool it uh, because not to make the same mistake the Taliban made of ignoring popular uh, uh, sentiments when it comes to enforcing uh, rules. Uh, ISIS, uh, which is al-Qaeda in Iraq's successor organization, has taken uh, 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 Zarqawi's practice of videotaping uh, beheadings uh, to a new level. Uh, bin Laden essentially decided to anoint Zarqawi as his deputy in Iraq, despite their considerable ideological differences, in order to extend the al-Qaeda brand to the Iraqi front, which had become increasingly important within uh, the global jihad. Although he absorbed uh, Zarqawi's ind independent group to give uh, al-Qaeda a stronger presence in Iraq and Europe, this also led to ideological tensions within al-Qaeda. Uh, in July, uh, as I mentioned, Zawahiri sent a letter to Zarqawi trying to rein him in. Uh, that was not taken uh, well by Zarqawi and his lieutenants. Uh, this ideological tensions and a power struggle over leadership of the global struggle eventually led to a break uh, between al-Qaeda and al-AQI, uh, renamed ISIS. Uh, and let me just stop there and I'll let my colleagues uh, pick up the story from there. So, David, I, I think we already see kind of one clear distinction between the narrative that the administration laid out last spring and what Jim does discuss. I mean, they're, they essentially kind of laid out a very static picture where you could kind of divide people up like in the football league and uh, say these guys are the good guys and these guys are the bad guys. Um, Jim just laid out a kind of a, a – that this has actually historically been a much more dynamic uh, structure and uh, so the question is, is does that dynamism um, continue today? And kind of what's the, the current state of it? So over to you. It, it's extraordinarily dynamic today. And um, you know, what Jim talked about, the split between 
al-Qaeda at ISIS, which previously was AQI, al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, is uh, a split that not only is very significant, but gives rise to a question that is asked every few years. That question is, is al-Qaeda dead? Uh, a few years ago, that question was being asked because of the Arab Spring and bin Laden's death. Uh, a lot of analysts thought that there could be no greater blow to al-Qaeda than the combination of these revolutionary events and the death of their leader. Uh, now, it didn't quite turn out that way. The revolutionary events, rather than ameliorating the uh, kind of grievances that had given rise to the jihadist movement, actually provided fertile soil for this movement to grow in ways that it hadn't before. Uh, now the question is, has the Islamic State, as the rise of ISIS, uh, killed al-Qaeda? Uh, it's a much subtler competition than most observers believe it to be. Uh, Al-Qaeda had a very well-formed strategy uh, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, uh, up until their split with Al-Qaeda. And it's still a very well-formed strategy, but it's one that, that ISIS has very effectively disrupted. Not defeated, uh, but disrupted. Uh, bin Laden was a chess player. Zawahiri is a chess player. And they very much have a chess player strategy, one that involves creating multiple front groups, operating under non-Al-Qaeda brands, and basically deceiving the enemy. This has worked very effectively for them in Syria, uh, a country where it's basically impossible at this point for the US to go after Al Qaeda without completely abandoning its strategy of supporting the moderate Syrian opposition because there is virtually no opposition faction that isn't in bed with Al Qaeda to a greater or lesser degree, uh, other than the Islamic State. But we're not going to support them, obviously. Um, but if you go back to the Iraq War, uh, which Jim talked about, uh, and that split between Zarqawi and Zawahiri, this is very influential in understanding the groups today. Uh, Zarqawi, many people thought that he had eclipsed Osama bin Laden as the leader of global jihadism. Uh, he was very much like ISIS is now, extraordinarily brutal, appealed to angry young men, and Zawahiri, in writing to Zarqawi in this, this letter that was intercepted and released by the US military in the summer of uh, summer 2005, it was released, right? right. Yeah. So um, when, when they released that letter, um, it, he said, you know, don't, be, uh, don't become enamored by these, young, these zealous young men who refer to you as the sheikh of the slaughterers, specifically referring to uh, Zarqawi's appeal to the youth. And now, if you look at what ISIS is doing, it's very similar to what AQI was doing then. <laughs> Extraordinary brutality. People were shocked by AQI's use of beheadings and the fact that they would videotape them and then post the videos online. Well, ISIS has completely eclipsed them in that regard. Uh, you had this brand that attracted young jihadists to the Iraq theater uh, and this romantic figure at the center of it. And I think in, in those ways as well, ISIS has eclipsed AQI. But just like AQI, ISIS is actually vulnerable to a complete brand collapse. This brand collapse happened, and it happened in large part because of a combination of three factors. One was a grassroots movement that opposed al-Qaeda, beginning in the Anbar province, called the Sahwa, or Awakening Movement, that eventually was spread throughout Iraq. The second factor uh, was the US troop surge, uh, which began in 2007. And the third was the US's shift to counterinsurgency. The combination of these three had al-Qaeda in Iraq essentially defeated by the end of 2009. Um, the amount of attacks it was able to carry out had, uh, had dwindled enormously, such that by the time the US pulled out of Iraq, while you could see signs that this group was coming back, a lot of analysts thought that it was defeated. Now, this is significant. I, I mentioned before that the Arab Spring gave rise to the question, is al-Qaeda defeated? And the reason why a lot of analysts answered yes was because they thought that the Iraq War had been so devastating to al-Qaeda that it couldn't come back. The reason why is because this symbolism that al-Qaeda in Iraq used the symbolism of extreme brutality, sectarian killings, went from being a symbol of strength when they were winning in Iraq to a symbol of overplaying their hand and having the population turn back against them. The same thing could happen to ISIS. ISIS's messaging is a winner's strategy. It's a winner's messaging. That is, beheading people, burning people alive, you know, it emphasizes their toughness. When they're losing, the symbol quickly shifts from them being tough them being the strongest horse, to them having overplayed their hand and people turning against them. Now, Al-Qaeda, at the start of the Arab Spring, as I said, people thought that they were dead. Um, they were not. They, in fact, had a good strategy to turn themselves into a 
uh, a mass movement and a subtle strategy. In countries like Tunisia, uh, Libya, Egypt, they operated under off-brands. And a lot of analysts still don't recognize that these off-brands are, in fact, al-Qaeda. You know, for one example is Katibat Ukba ibn Nafi, uh, which is a Tunisia-based jihadist group, which openly this year started proclaiming itself to be a division of al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. One of the early analysts uh, who called that it was actually part of al-Qaeda is Tom on this panel. And um, you know, this, his, when he said this, it was met with extreme skepticism. The skepticism that it was met with lasted up until Uqba ibn Nafi started openly proclaiming that they were part of al-Qaeda. But this is what al-Qaeda does. You know, in areas where they think their brand isn't particularly strong or where they think that it will attract too much enemy attention, they'll operate under sometimes an off-brand, sometimes multiple off-brands. And they were able to, to build up a movement this way with a, a lot of things that analysts would refuse to acknowledge as al-Qaeda. Now, ISIS disrupted this strategy. Uh, ISIS disrupted this strategy for uh, two reasons. One is a major innovation that, uh, that, that ISIS had, which is their use of social media. They're very, very good at it, and it really changes a lot of dynamics. The second innovation, or the second um, reason they're effective vis-a-vis al-Qaeda, is because they know al-Qaeda. They emerged from al-Qaeda. And so what they're doing is taking al-Qaeda's chess player strategy, where you know, Al-Qaeda's um, view is, well, we're nowhere, right? They're, we're operating under these different brands, and they take it very literally. They say, yes, you're nowhere. We, the Islamic State, are everywhere. They're very noisy. They have a very obvious strategy. And given that a lot of analysts tend to interpret Al-Qaeda and jihadist groups in the most obvious way possible, uh, a lot of analysts believe that ISIS, in fact, has completely eclipsed Al-Qaeda. You can see many articles on that. As I said, they're effective. They've gotten Boko Haram to leave the Al-Qaeda network to go to the ISIS network. They got Ansar Bayt al-Muqdis. And you know, Al-Qaeda is threatened in other places, particularly in Tunisia. But so one example of the reason why this strategy has been good for ISIS is their Africa Khan. Uh, they, got, they, they managed to, through their use of social media, convince ma- major media outlets, BBC, CNN, that ISIS was in control of the town of Derna, the city of Derna. They were never in control. They were always one of many factions. But they convinced the media that they controlled this city, which was helpful to them in luring Boko Haram to their network. Another thing that they did is, you remember the attack in Tunis on the uh, Bardot Museum? Uh, that was an al-Qaeda attack. That was carried out by Katibat Uqba ibn Nafi, which I'd already mentioned. ISIS understood that al-Qaeda would not claim credit until the attackers, because they were still at large, had managed to uh, either flee the scene or else were caught or killed. And so you know, ISIS put in this disruptive claim of credit, completely fake, but a, a disruptive claim of credit that they had carried out the Bardot Museum attack, understanding that AQ wasn't prepared to, carry it, to put in this claim, and also understanding that AQ had a relatively weak media apparatus. At any rate, um, ISIS has been disruptive, but um, one result has been that al-Qaeda has been able to pivot a bit. Before his death, because of the damage done by ISIS's predecessor to al-Qaeda's brand, Bin Laden wanted to change al-Qaeda's brand. He thought about even operating under a new label. Well, there's no better way for al-Qaeda to rebrand itself than having these sociopaths out on the battlefield, ISIS, which is a stark contrast to al-Qaeda's own new rules of engagement, which are much more constrained. And uh, in light of the fact that you have this brewing Sunni-Shia conflict throughout the region in a lot of theaters, uh, ranging from Syria to Yemen, the most prominent ones, Uh, Other Sunni states are looking at al-Qaeda as maybe someone we can do business with, unlike the Islamic State. So when we look at the question of whether al-Qaeda and and whether the Islamic State, um, both groups may be with us for a while. When I say that ISIS's brand could collapse, I don't mean that it's inevitable, but it may. Like, if their winner's messaging is turned to a loser's loser's messaging, they are in big, big trouble. Uh, But they may be with us for a long time to come. This competition may be with us for a long time to come. Um, Al-Qaeda may be forced to, to... uh, mimic ISIS and become much more open in its messaging, or it may continue to pivot. And it may decide that, that the most effective thing to do is to continue to let people think that their brand is somewhat of a dying one, while at the same time positioning themselves to subtly take over entire oppositions in countries, just like in Syria, everyone now, every rebel group is working with al-Qaeda. So, uh, Tom, so again, I think we see another distinction between the narrative that the president laid out last fall – 
and what we've talked about here today. So Jim talks, laid out how this is much more dynamic. Um, not only administration kind of say portrayed a much more static threat, but they actually compartmentalized it and made an argument that we've got a handle on this. So the Iranian branch, they said, look, we're going to reach an accommodation with Iran, and so that's not a problem. Uh, ISIS, we will continue to work with the Iraqis and eventually a trit and mitigate and defeat them. And Al Qaeda's already dead. Um, so they've got an answer for all three of those. Um, putting aside the Iranian piece and the ISIS piece, let's dig into the one in which the, the administration feels it's kind of been there and done that, which is Al Qaeda. And what is the, the true nature of Al Qaeda today in, in the, the global Islamist insurgency movement? Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, you know, there's actually the title of this uh, panel here today is Defining and Defeating the Global Islamist Insurgency. And they're actually, we all, I think, I well, think we all want to defeat the insurgency, but there are two words in that that I really like. Uh, one is defining, and the reason for that is that if you go through the history of all this, I like to say if there are 17 uh, agencies in the U.S. intelligence community, there are probably 20-plus definitions of al-Qaeda. So there's actually not a commonly accepted definition of al-Qaeda to this day. This is some, you know, an enemy we've been dealing with for a long time, and yet if you go across the government, USG, you find that nobody can really define it with any sort of precision or accuracy. But the second word is insurgency, and because I think that starts to uh, unfold or unpack what a, what a reasonable and rational definition based on the actual evidence says about what al-Qaeda is and what it has been from the beginning. Because we always think of al-Qaeda as being terrorists, and Osama bin Laden as being a terrorist, and the current, you know, al-Qaeda leaders around the globe as being terrorists. They certainly are that. They use terrorism as a tactic to achieve their political goals. But terrorism is in fact, just a tactic in their overall broader strategy. They are, first and foremost, and Osama bin Laden was from, right from when he founded al-Qaeda in 1988, political revolutionaries. This is a very different way of looking at it. Political revolutionaries want to achieve political goals across the greater, in this case, the greater Muslim-majority world. They want to basically overturn the existing world order and install their version of government, their version of law, their way of doing things. Now, if you, if you stop for a second and think about the import of that, um, it goes right to the heart of what you were talking about, Jim, in terms of defining down the threat and defining down al-Qaeda. Because one of the big things we've seen is this concept of al-Qaeda's core. People have heard this phrase, al-Qaeda core, right? There's the al-Qaeda core in Pakistan that's sort of just, you know, waiting to be droned to death. And everything else that's going on isn't really al-Qaeda. It's something lesser than al-Qaeda. Well, that's actually not how al-Qaeda is structured. Uh, that, that definition, that sort of... Uh, false dichotomy, I would say, of threats is basically uh, an advent of the West. It's not something that's actually based or rooted in uh, an understanding of al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda's own files. And to give you an example, I think I was here 10 years ago at another heritage event on the files that were captured from Saddam's regime after the fall of the regime. And back then, 10 years ago, I was advocating for transparency when it came to captured files. Here I am 10 years later, still advocating for transparency when it comes to captured files. But in this case, it goes to the files captured in Osama bin Laden's compound. And here I have the entire corpus of declassified bin Laden files. Uh, I could not fit, possibly, all the files that were captured in bin Laden's compound in this file folder. The reason for that is because more than a million documents and files were actually captured in bin Laden's compound. Now, now, let that number sink in for a second. More than a million documents and files. Now, not all were equally important. Some of them were, you know, paying the electricity bill and that sort of thing. But a lot of them were very important. A lot of them had, uh, you know, real uh, meaning for how we understand these things. What's interesting is you talk about the field, and David and I lament this quite often. Um, very few analysts have actually engaged in any sort of rigorous way the roughly only two dozen or so files that have been released from Bin Laden's compound. What do these files say about al-Qaeda and how it's structured? Does it support the idea that there's a small core of al-Qaeda waiting for the next missile to come in and kill them? Or does it say something different? And it says something very different. In fact, when you get into how al-Qaeda is structured, um, I use the phrase affiliates. Many people use the phrase affiliates. Actually, is not the right way to think about it. The way al-Qaeda talks about it is that basically there's this management layer of al-Qaeda, which has multiple components to itself. But then there are each regional branches. And each regional branch has an emir who swears by at an oath of loyalty to al-Qaeda's emir, the head of al-Qaeda. So what you have is basically al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, for example, which is tasked with basically North Africa from, you know, uh, to the side of Egypt all the way to Morocco, let's say, and down into Mali. Or you have al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is uh, tasked with waging jihad inside the Arabian Peninsula, conveniently enough for their name. 
uh, or you have Shabab in East Africa, uh, which is sort of in charge of that region, or you have Jabhat al-Nusra, the Nusra Front in Syria, which is actually in charge of sort of their, their efforts in the Levant. And then late last year, there was a new al-Qaeda branch set up called al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, which is in charge of waging jihad there. Now, just take a step back for a second, and what I'll say to you was most amazing, my most amazing observation I've seen in all this, through all the years of doing this, is that there's a lot more cohesion across that network of organizations than people in the U.S. government, people in the administration want to believe. And the reason we know that, in part, is because of what's in bin Laden's files. Because you can see the cohesion. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are disagreements. Yes, he has management issues. Yes, they have all sorts of issues uh, in terms of pushing their agenda forward. But there's a lot more cohesion to that network. So in fact, uh, you know, one of the big arguments, uh, David mentioned how in the Arab Spring, uh, quite accurately, so David is not giving himself enough credit. He was one of the few analysts that was forcefully pushing for the idea that Al the Arab Spring had not killed Al Qaeda. And he basically compiled this whole document of all these great quotes and uh, phrases from jihadists about how they're going to take advantage of the Arab Spring, which is really a seminal piece of work. Um, and in fact, if you look at bin Laden's files, bin Laden was looking at the Arab Spring as a giant opportunity for Al Qaeda and was dispatching operatives to the Arab Spring nations to take advantage of it. They discussed that at length. But here's the interesting thing. So you say, OK, well, Arab Spring was going to kill Al Qaeda. It didn't. One of the other things you hear is that, well, bin Laden was killed, and Ayman al-Zawahiri was far less charismatic, and so that's going to basically shatter the entire Al Qaeda network. Well, it didn't. The rise of the Islamic State or ISIS, as clearly as David gave a great lay layout of the whole thing, has definitely challenged Al Qaeda's authority in the global jihadist world. Absolutely, and they've had a they've had a growing market share in a number of different areas. Um, but they, one of the reasons why they have not surpassed Al Qaeda globally is because the structure I talked about of the regional branches, the regional emirs swearing an oath of loyalty to uh, the head of Al Qaeda remains intact. That none of the regional emirs, other than the head of ISIS, which in fact are the Islamic State, who was himself a regional emir of Al Qaeda. And basically, maybe one way to think about this is the head of Al Qaeda is sort of the Don in the Mafia family, and then he has these captains. And basically, the head of the Islamic State or ISIS is a captain who says, you know, I'm not going to answer to the Don anymore. I want to be the Don. You know, that's maybe one way of thinking about it. Well, all the other captains salute the flag and remain loyal to Al Qaeda's emir and remain loyal to this day. That's a, that's a very interesting case study in sort of understanding al-Qaeda, because almost all the analyst prognostications would say that that wasn't going to happen. You can go to op-eds in the Washington Post and everywhere else. They were talking about how, oh, with, you know, Zawahiri taking over, you know, that that's basically the end of al-Qaeda. You know, they needed bin Laden to hold, keep the whole thing together. And in fact, they didn't. Uh, now, they've had, you know, as I said, major problems with ISIS, and David laid out the competition between the two, so I won't go into that. But if you look back at the history of all this, um, Another thing that's stunning is how many assessments have been wrong about al-Qaeda from the intelligence community through the years. And for example, just this week, we had the Washington Post's Greg Miller wrote up a review or a, a, a brief summary of Mike Morell's book, who was at the CIA. And it says that uh, Mike Morell says in his book that the CIA got air, the Arab Spring totally wrong. You know, we didn't know that al-Qaeda was going to rise throughout the Arab Spring or take advantage of it. And what's interesting about that is, uh, I know, David and I know that's not the, that there, there was plenty of evidence to say that they could take advantage of it because we were arguing it. You know, there were plenty of other contrary assessments out there, and yet the intelligence community didn't see it. And why is that? And it goes back to this, the constant theme that, uh, that Jim, you, you brought up in your opening remarks. It's this defining down of al-Qaeda and understanding what it is. You talked about the map. I don't see Mary's map, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's great. But, there, there, but she uses that to emphasize the cohesion, and that's, that's right. There's a lot more cohesion to this entity than uh, it's given credit for. Um, but going forward, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with one last assessment of al-Qaeda, and we can get into some discussion. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about drones, of course, especially of late with the unfortunate killing of two hostages in a drone strike, uh, you know, and, you know, basically the efficacy of drones and that sort of thing. Um, my colleague Bill Roggio actually invented drone coverage <laughs> years ago. He's been studying these things for years and reports on each and every drone cover uh, strike that goes down. And there's no question that the drone strikes have killed off a lot of senior al-Qaeda leaders and have disrupted operations and have done damage to the organization. There's no question about that. But the problem is that there's this triumphalistic assessment that says, well, that's it, the drones have killed al-Qaeda and everything else isn't really al-Qaeda. Well, going back to bin Laden's files, it's very interesting to read how al-Qaeda assessed it because there are certain analysts who cherry-picked these to say, oh, see, the, uh, the drones were killing al-Qaeda. 
But if you read them carefully, what you see is that Al Qaeda had a number of components to its strategy to survive the drone strikes. That yes, there are phrases, passages, paragraphs in these files that say the drones are hurting us, the drones are hurting us, we need to survive this. But then you'll see other paragraphs and passages where in fact Al Qaeda says, well, here's what we're going to do to survive this. And in fact, Al Qaeda's leadership did survive it. And one of the ways they did that was by dispatching leaders to Arab Spring nations. So in fact, going back to this idea of the core Al Qaeda, the definition of core Al Qaeda is not firm. It's something the U.S. intelligence community can't even really well define for you. But it's this idea that it's basically Ayman al here and his band of not so merry men in Pakistan, you know, and then everything else isn't really core Al Qaeda. Well, one of the big lessons in all this, it's a very commonsensical observation, is that core Al Qaeda leaders, by any reasonable definition, operate in at least half a dozen or more countries to this day leading the charge. Guys who were groomed by Osama bin Laden to lead the charge, guys who were part of the Al Qaeda hierarchy people that were dispatched intentionally by al-Qaeda to go to these different areas to sort of lead their efforts in different nations, including in Syria. And in fact, if you look at Syria right now, what you're seeing is, I think, the impact of that core al-Qaeda leadership in Syria and how they've organized efforts. Because um, at, you look back to the beginning of this year, I think, to be this whole, this is in the case that probably al-Qaeda has captured more territory since January 1 globally than, than ISIS, the Islamic State, which is not something you hear, right? And part of the reason for that is because Al-Qaeda's got a very clever strategy. They're embedding themselves in these local insurgencies. They're basically forcing themselves down in so they're not easily targeted. And so if you look at what's happened just since March of this year, Al-Qaeda led the charge in taking over the provincial capital of Idlib in Syria. Al-Qaeda led the charge in various other battles in northern Syria. Al-Qaeda is leading the charge in southern Syria. So they're capturing territory, and they do it under different names or different brands. But when you follow the leaders, we do the nerd analysis that I do every day, we do all the time, you can see that these guys are clearly, in fact, Al-Qaeda. And so Al-Qaeda isn't dead. It's still very much alive. Uh, ISIS, of course, is very much alive, unfortunately. And uh, nobody's on the run, uh, basically, at this point. Right. So if you have a question, if you'd raise your hand. And do we have a guy with a microphone? Okay, um, we will get to you. I just had a couple of quick questions real quick. Um, anybody in the panel real quick? Um, what's the future of al-Nusra in Syria, and who, who are they going to, whose flag are they going to run up? You want me to take that? Real quick? Um, sure. I'm kind of passionate about this one because there are all these reports saying the Nusra Front's going to break with al-Qaeda. I would love uh, to place a major wager on this, if anybody could, uh, to bet against that because it shows a complete ignorance of how Nusra Front's actually organized and who its leadership is and all those other things. It's still al-Qaeda. It's very much al-Qaeda. What Ayman al-Zawahiri did at the beginning of the Arab Spring with all this was he didn't want Nusra Front or any other al-Qaeda parties in Syria to say we're al-Qaeda. They wanted to hide the fact that they were al-Qaeda. And the re there was a lot of reasons to laid them out in terms of trying to get support from Gulf actors from different nation states to, to help in the insurgency. So Nusra is still very much al-Qaeda. And in fact, this reporting goes back in part to a Sharia official in Nusra Front who was actually fired from that job, who basically has been advocating for sort of a breakup with Al-Qaeda in a certain sense. And his replacement is very quite openly clear about how the fact that's not going to happen. You can even read his tweets if you want in Arabic on a day-to-day -day basis about this. So, are, are they going to be running their flag up in Damascus? I'd say no. But um, okay. let, me, let me actually add one sure. wrinkle, which I think this, this shows, in my view, uh, just how disruptive ISIS has been. My assessment uh, is that there's a strong chance, like an over 50% chance, that were it not for ISIS, that Nusra would have left al-Qaeda. Um, and when, when I say left, like envision air quotes around that, mm -hmm. right? That, that it's consistent with them operating under front groups in order to attain an objective. And in this case, the objective they could have attained is massive state sponsorship. You have a massive infusion of cash through Qatar, et cetera, which actually is they're happening anyway. anyway. Right. It's right. happening anyway yeah, because right. they've, um, they're have they operating under an umbrella. But that's group. all branding. It's not real functional. No, it, yeah. Right. It yeah. is branding. Yeah. But I mean, even just from a branding perspective, sure. I think they would have actually switched to an off-brand and broken with al-Qaeda. And the reason they, they didn't is actually because ISIS has, such, has put such pressure on them that it makes their, their chess player strategy very difficult. I think I, that al-Qaeda has a very good two-player game strategy. When it's them versus the U.S. or them against non-Muslim powers, they have a very good strategy. But then you interject a third player, that being ISIS, and suddenly that disrupts the game. And I don't think they've quite figured out how to deal with it. The reason why I don't think they'll get to Damascus is, you know, look, this is an area where um, Iran is willing to put lots of soldiers to fight and die. And so I think that Damascus could help hold out. But right now you have, you know, a country where Nusra and ISIS together control 
you know, more territory, I would say, than the recognized government does. Yeah, just one other question real quick. Um, so if, if uh, a Iran deal is signed and um, the ISIS continues to be attrited in, in Iraq, you could well see the administration leave office saying, well, we, we won the war on terror. And, and will that kind of take, is there a potential that we will take our eye off the ball? But, but, I think, you know, they've said it before, right? They, we, we heard that they won the war on terror when bin Laden died, essentially. You, the, at that point, you had um, statements coming out from Leon Panetta and others talking about how AQ is just a few leaders away from strategic defeat. And so they, they might say it, but when you look at the world, it's, it's simply implausible. I mean, ISIS retracting still doesn't solve the problem of jihadism in Iraq. It certainly doesn't solve the problem in Syria. It doesn't solve the problem in Libya, which has collapsed into civil war. It doesn't solve the problem in Egypt. And the, all these problems I named are all post-2011 problems. So uh, it, it might be said, but it's, it's, it'd be impossible to believe you in sure. 2016. It's incredible. So we have a question down front. Can we bring a microphone down here first? And then there's a question over there. And then that may get us to the end of the hour. Hi, I'm Penny Starr with CNS News. Thank you for um, this panel discussion. Are you familiar, I want to ask when we're talking about defining uh, terrorists as an Islamic threat, of the author Ayan Hirsi Ali, who yeah. is, uh, was a Muslim and is now saying that the only way to defeat this threat is for the religion itself to be transformed into something that at its core calls for Sharia law and the death of infidels. And she's, she claims that the only way to defeat them is to get to that ideology and have the Muslim faith changed not to include that goal. Yes, we do have a whole second panel on that, but anybody want to? Yeah, I think in, in the long run that uh, might be possible, but I doubt it uh, any time in the next few centuries. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think it's, it's the ideology uh, that has to be not only defeated but discredited, and 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 to do that, it had, Muslims have to be convinced that that ideology, those ideas, have bad consequences, not just for us but for them. And if there's a silver lining in the cloud with you know the emergence of ISIS and these increasingly thuggish revolutionary groups, is that that might lead uh, some to uh, rethink their support for these kind of groups, uh, especially, you know, when they get in these fraternal battles uh, or, you know, talking about D Damascus, uh, I think that could boil down to Hezbollah uh, against Al-Qaeda and it, it'll be hell on earth, you know, it's what, what they, not exactly what they promised, but what they deliver. Hey, um, Lise? Hi, Lisa Curtis with the Heritage Foundation. Um, I wondered if you could expound a bit on the ISIS Al Qaeda competition and how much actual fighting on the ground between the two sides have we seen, and how much do you expect to see in the future? We keep hearing these sporadic or uh, reports of sporadic fighting between ISIS and Al Qaeda factions in Afghanistan. Uh, we know a drone strike took out a former Taliban leader, leader who had pledged allegiance to ISIS uh, a couple months ago. And of course, we had the major attack in Jalalabad um, conducted by ISIS, and the Taliban actually distanced it itself from the attack. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if you could address, you know, how much they have engaged each other militarily, uh, al-Qaeda and ISIS, and how much you expect in the future. And then also if you could just comment on ISIS presence in Afghanistan and how you see that evolving. The, the uh, clashes have been sporadic, just as you said. Um, you've had a few dramatic instances, such as ISIS's assassination of Abu Khalid al-Suri, who was uh, in Syria, uh, embedded with one of the Sunni jihadist groups. Uh, the Qaeda front group, which is, again, yeah. to, your branding, to our branding point. Yeah, yeah precisely. Yeah. But um, you know, it, it's actually been a very subtle competition, um, where a lot of the fighting between them has been more in the shadows than, than up front. Uh, and they cooperate in certain areas. They cooperated uh, when moving into the Armuk refugee camp. They cooperated around Kalamun. Uh, and so when I look at, at, at what's happening, you know, the reason why from, from al-Qaeda's perspective, a number of analysts thought they had to, um, they had to fight ISIS. And you know, after Abu Khalid al-Suri was killed, Tom and I kind of flirted with that idea as well. But 
I, I, there, what Al Qaeda looks at ISIS as is you know, this disruptive force that came out of their movement. Um, it's created new growth opportunities, and they'd like to get it back. So their, their criticisms have generally focused on ISIS leadership, while at the same time trying to create more cooperation between foot soldiers. Um, and um, it seems like they're, I, I would put their what they've done into a few different categories. Number one, sometimes you know, moves to make sure that loyalty is maintained within the ranks. So within Tunisia, uh, the Karawan branch of Uqba ibn Nafi, which I talked about in my opening statement, um, basically put out a statement pledging allegiance, well, all but pledging allegiance to, um, to ISIS. And uh, it seems that the response by Uqba ibn Nafi's leadership, that's, that, that is the al-Qaeda uh, loyal leadership, was to turn in the local branch of the, uh, the, the leader of the local branch in Karawan to authorities. He was arrested, and subsequently you didn't get any of these loud statements from Karawan. Um, I think that if you look at these kind of mysterious groups, um, resistance groups to ISIS who are assassinating ISIS officials, I think that the chances are sky high that Al Qaeda is involved in covert assassination campaigns against officials who they believe are ISIS loyalists. I think that what they're doing is setting the stage for um, if and when, uh, well, let's say when, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi finally dies, um, they're setting the stage for ISIS either coming back largely into the AQ fold, or B, uh, significant defections, or C, a more cooperative relationship, uh, with, which if you follow some of the press reporting uh, about uh, Baghdadi's temporary replacement, uh, there's some press reporting, including in Time Magazine, that significantly suggests that he'd been an al-Qaeda loyalist previously, and that he uh, may be um, much more open to a cooperative relationship with al-Qaeda, which suddenly puts their chess player's strategy uh, back into play as a very powerful force. And just real quickly, uh, in related, uh, since long we're talking about this issue, the future relationship between Iran and, and these insurgent groups, is it always going to be competitive, or is there going to be cooperation there as well? Well, okay, this is the most bizarre thing I've witnessed in, in terms of Iran and al-Qaeda over the last couple of years. I'll just try and say this quickly. So from July 2011 on, there are a series of designations by the Obama administration's Treasury and State Departments saying that Iran and al-Qaeda have this deal, a working agreement that basically allows al-Qaeda to use Iranian soil to transit fighters, funds, all sorts of things. Now, this is not surprising, as Jim was talking about. This, this, they've had a relationship going back to the early 1990s. Um, but what's really bizarre about this deal is that some of the guys who have head, headed the network inside Iran are now were allowed to leave Iran to go to Syria to lead the charge against Assad, uh, the Assad regime and Iranian-backed forces inside Syria. And what the calculation here is on the Iranians' part, I have no idea, but it's very strange. In fact, when one of the guys from al-Qaeda who led this network temporarily in Iran went back to Syria, the ISIS fanboys on Twitter were yelling at him, oh, here comes Iran's boy into Syria. The, that's how well known it was that he was al-Qaeda's man in, in Iran for a time. So it's very strange. So the bottom line is, yeah, they're, always, they're, they're killing each other on the battlefields of Syria. They're at odds, of course, through proxies in Yemen and elsewhere. But yet there's still a deal after all these years which allows some kind of collusion, and that's what's really strange. So I, I should go back and read my history of the Borgias, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry that we're, we're out of town for this panel. We will reassemble at 11.15, um, I guess. All right. Make sure I'm squared away here. Yeah, 11.15 for the next panel. Uh, thank you so much. Please join me in, in uh, thanking our panelists.